Welcome everyone to a, another edition of Crisis Conversations live from the Better Life Lab. In this podcast, we've explored and will continue to explore in upcoming episodes how the pandemic is disproportionately impacting women. Uh, women are carrying more of the childcare, housework, and homeschooling load from early surveys. You know, although so much is still unfolding, we don't really know. Um, but we also know that women, especially women of color, are disproportionately being laid off and furloughed and struggling with unemployment. Uh, you know, and now that many businesses are beginning to reopen, and yet childcare, summer camp, and schools are not, uh, nor is there much talk of a, of a bailout of the childcare industry. You know, no one seems to be talking about that. There is a fear that women will again be forced to step back or step away from work because of caregiving responsibilities. And that will only exacerbate existing inequalities in pay, advancement, opportunity, and time. Uh, but today we're gonna focus on men. And where did the idea come from that men's role, uh, the, the sort of the, the role that they should play in family should be the, the breadwinner, the provider, and that women should be primarily responsible for care, you know? And how have those notions, how have they changed or evolved, especially as women uh, really entered the workforce in mass in the late 1970s and 80s and uh, what's changed and what hasn't, and particularly looking at what's happening now with the pandemic. So we've got a great panel today, the experts and fathers. Uh, we also hope to hear your stories, your thoughts and questions. So please, as, uh, please do use the chat function and our producer, David Schulman, will reach out to you and bring you into the conversation. You know, before we dive into the pandemic, um, you know, and, and also the protests for racial justice and how that's changing, um, you know, how, how that's changing cha men and fatherhood ideals. It's, I, I do wanna start with a little bit of context. Um, so we're gonna start with a story from Glenn Henry. He's a musician and a rapper. He's a father who chronicles his life on YouTube, on his YouTube channel called Belief in Fatherhood. He wasn't able to join us today because he's busy promoting a new documentary on dads produced by Bryce Dallas Howard, uh, featuring her father, filmmaker Ron Howard. So I spoke with him a few days ago about what a rude awakening he had when childcare costs were getting far higher than he and his wife could afford as their family grew. And so with his wife earning more, he became the, ch the children's primary caregiver. So let's listen to Glenn. I thought it was gonna be boring and there was gonna be nothing to do. And the children, I would just kind of, you know, be bored, you know? And then uh, one weekend with both children, I, I cried in the mirror you know, um, <laughs> where both of my kids were outside of the door crying in the bathroom. And I and I was inside the bathroom just looking in the mirror, just tearful, just couldn't like not being able to um, function. You know, I didn't realize it was going to be so emotionally challenging. Um, and so when I stepped into the role as primary caregiver, um, it gave me a lot of grace and understanding for uh, women who do feel do feel that role. Um, and a lot of times the husband's response or, or the father's response or whatever, um, the partner's response is, well, you got through the day, but why isn't dinner ready or why isn't this clean or why isn't, you know, and it's kind of like the goal is that every no one died today. <laughs> you know, we made it through the day and everyone survived, <laughs> you know, and so I started to. I started to have a conversation with my male friends about, you know, them being frustrated with them, with their wives because they're not doing anything. And I'm like, actually, she's doing way more. You know, she's talking to your mother on the phone. You know what I mean? She's having conversations with uh, people in the community so your kids can have a social life. She's doing so much that you don't have to do. And she would trade you while you're complaining about traffic. She would trade the amount of time just sitting in traffic just to be alone with her thoughts. You know, so, so that, let me start with my colleague, Haley Swenson. So Haley, she's the deputy director of the Better Life Lab. And she's also, she's got a PhD when it comes to studying gender and sexuality. Um, she's also been a lead author on some of the work that we've been doing at the Better Life Lab to study men and care. Um, so Haley, Glenn clearly felt unprepared for his role as a primary caregiver. So what can you tell us about how, how common that is for men? I, well, 
Thank you, Bridget, for having me. And I, I just was smiling throughout that whole recording because um, it's a lot of what we've heard from men who are now at home with the kids. And certainly it resonated with uh, a lot of the research that we've done and the focus groups that we um, conducted for this men in care study. And one of the, the things that we found when we talked to men about really we would ask what prepared you to be a dad and um, it was sort of two things, either nothing, nothing prepared me, <laughs> or it was it was watching my own dad or my own mom be a caregiver. And then and then men would from that sort of figure out what they're doing. And, and the truth is being a primary caregiver to kids is hard for anyone. But one of the differences is that girls grow up babysitting. They grow mm. up, you know, um, thinking of themselves as future caregivers. When I, I used to teach college classes on this, I would ask my students, you know, raise your hand if you've given thought to your future career and how you'll balance it with, with family life. The women in the class would raise their hands because they knew this was something they were going to have to figure out and think about themselves as caregivers as well as, as potential earners. Um, but men in my classes hadn't thought of that. And so it's just really a question of, preparation in, in a lot of um, a lot of cases. Uh, but the men, when we did talk to them, often got a lot of joy out of this experience. They, they would talk about the things that were particularly stressful about their role as dads. Um, but they would sort of say, you know, where's the support? And, and one of the comparisons men in the focus group would make is women who've entered professions, especially high status professions, they form they form groups, support groups on how to do that, how to enter mm. in industries that haven't been friendly to women. Where are the dads groups? You know, where are the where are the men who are getting together and talking to each other about how we can support each other? And so it's certainly what Glenn's saying there sounds sounds a lot like what I heard in this study. So I want to stay with you, Haley, for just a minute more. So you just released a new report this week on engaged dads. And some of the some of the findings really surprised me in terms of what men themselves said they valued or, or was what was important to them as fathers. Can you share some of the sort of the top level findings? Absolutely. So one of the things that really struck me about this is that generally sociologists of these questions, folks who study it, they've seen traditionally kind of three P's when it comes to what men do around the house providing, protecting, and playmates, right? Mm. So there, these are sort of the three things that have been acceptable for dads to do throughout the years when it comes to engaging with their kids. Um, and we expected because of, of uh, you know, the state of research, the state of what we know about how much of the care burden falls on women, we expected to find sort of things that would confirm that that's how men are thinking about these roles. In fact, the two biggest um, answers to a question we asked, which was, you know, what is very important to you when it comes to what fathers should do, uh, we gave some options. Financial support, financial providing was actually on the lower end of the list of things that were that dad said were very important. Higher yeah. on that list were the highest one was showing love and affection, wow. which I found really moving. You know, that there were other direct caregiving items that came back as well, um, tra giving transportation to kids, making sure they're safe, teaching them about life. But this showing love and affection was so emotional and so sort of in touch with these intangible aspects of caregiving that women have done and, and and often has been unacknowledged that women have done and it takes up time. And more fathers said that was very important than any other task. So I found that that actually pretty hopeful as a sign of just how far fatherhood has come in recent decades. Yeah, I thought that was so fascinating. That's what struck me the most. You know, we tend to think of, of men as providers, like you say, the three Ps and breadwinners. Uh, and that was a really astounding finding. So let me turn to Dan Carlson now. So Dan, he's a sociologist at the University of Georgia. He's an expert with the research group, the Council on Contemporary Families. And he has produced some really fascinating research over the years on the gender division of labor. And I, you know, we've written and, and cited you in many of our, uh, of our work. Uh, uh, so you know, you've also talked about uh, how the fairer sharing of the work at home leads to better relationships and even better sex. So Dan, you've also been studying how the pandemic is impacting men. Uh, you know, during this really, um, uh, this, this time of global crisis. Uh, and when we spoke the other day, you, you know, you'd said some people are calling the pandemic a disaster for feminism, but you say it could also be an op opportunity. So can you talk a little bit more about what you're finding and why this could be an opportunity? Sure, Bridget, uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so the, the people are concerned, right, that the, the COVID pandemic is going to you know, reverse 60 years worth of feminist progress because schools are closed and childcare centers are closed um, and uh, people are working from home. 
Uh, and so, you know, there is a sort of uh, elimination of the lines between work and family here. Um, and traditionally, right, when it comes to domestic labor, this is women's responsibility. Um, and so if there's more to do, then it seems like this is going to fall onto women's laps, um, mother's laps. Um, but at the same time, right, and, and this goes to Haley's findings, right, we know that men want to be engaged at home, right? Men overwhelmingly, um, you know, believe uh, in gender equality, as, you know, the General Social Survey has showed us, um, you know, for years. Um, they want to be engaged dads. Um, and it seems that more or less it's, it's structural issues, not culture, not attitudes that is preventing this. And so if we think but, about- but, well, let, let me interrupt you for just a second, Dan. What do you mean structural issues? What's, what's, key, what's getting in the way of men you know, if so many say they want to be engaged caregivers, right. then why still are, are women, you know, when you look at, say, the, you know, some of the studies that you even cite, time use research, women are still spending about twice the amount of time doing childcare and yeah. housework. So what, what's, what are the structural things getting in the way? Um, it's, it's work family policy. Um, and this is a the a, lack of the lack of it, you mean, in the United right, States, right? Right, indeed. Um, and, you know, this is at the workplace level. Um, and this is also at the state and federal level. So it's about a lack of access to per parental leave for men, paternity leave. Um, it's uh, about workplace culture, all right? And this notion of the ideal worker, you know, men don't, you know, wanna be just breadwinners, but that's what the ex is expected of them at work, right? And so they're fearful of lack of promotion. They're fearful mm -hmm. of lack of raises if they, you know, um, show an inclination towards being more engaged at home, right? Um, and so, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a stigma, right, associated with taking leave and, and, and pulling back a bit. Um, and so, so it, you know, if you ask them, again, men personally, they want to do this, they want to be engaged, um, but there seems to be barriers. And those barriers are eliminated in some respects by the pandemic, right? People are forced to work from home um, or they're just like lost their jobs. Um, and so the question is, you know, when the rubber meets the road in this instance, right, to use the analogy, do men actually step up, right, and, and, and then engage? Um, and our results say, yes, they are, right? Wow. So, you know, the um, proportion of families that are, sh uh, or couples that are sharing housework um, has increased over 60%. It's gone from 27% to 41%. Um, and the proportion of, of couples that are sharing in childcare equally has also increased from like 45% to 56%. So there's substantial growth here. Now, of course, right, you know, um, the other side of that coin is that women are still, and many families still doing the majority of work in this environment, but yeah. there has been movement right, towards more sharing. And, and, you know, you can come to a more equal division of labor in a couple of pathways. One is that women maybe just do less. Well, another is that men do more, or it could be a combination of the both. Uh, and what we're finding is that you know the the, the increase in equality is is driven by men doing more, mm. um, and 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 that's the that's the good news of the pandemic. At the same time, the 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 bad news is that there are a lot of women who are doing more, and they tend to be in families um, and in couples where they were already doing the majority of work, so their burdens have have been um, increased. Um, yeah. So so it's not all you know um, utopia. <laughs> There is some good news, obviously, that men are doing more, and this has resulted in more equality. Um, but there's also, in, in you know, a substantial number of families, women who are, whose burdens have been increased. So, you know, I, and I want to go to Dan Herman. We've got a, a, a father here from the New York City Dads Group. So, like uh, like Haley said, there are there are some groups forming uh, for men to kind of. Uh, have affinity or support uh, for each other. So Dan, we're going to come to you in just a minute. But Dan Carlson, if I could, if I could stay with you, um, you know, in the pandemic, you know, one of the things that we've seen, like with remote work, that it's really become a signifier of class. You know, that if you're a white collar worker, you're much more likely to be able to work remotely or work from home. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of essential workers who have to continue going into work. Um, you know, there are a lot of single parent families, single mother families where they, you know, they're bearing the entire burden. Um, you know, one of the things that Haley and I have just written a piece for The Guardian where we looked a lot at healthcare workers who are majority women, um, you know, nurses and other healthcare professionals. And if they're in, you know, partnered with men, their husbands have really had to, to step up. So you're seeing kind of like a whole wide variety of, of different experiences for different families. And I'm wondering if that's something 
you know, that you've been able to take a look at or, um, you know, kind of how this men stepping up more at home, um, how it might play out differently in different families, depending upon your circumstance in the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. So um, we are starting to tease out sort of how these work characteristics among parents are associated with these changes. So we've been looking at, um, you know, the impact of unemployment, the impact of reducing hours, taking leave, the impact of, of telecommuting. Um, and so the results generally show that that the more time that a parent is spending at home, the more work that they're doing. Hmm. Um, and so for men, you know, 40% of them in our survey are telecommuting. Um, and so there's a, a notable increase in the amount of time they're spending doing housework and childcare when they're telecommuting. But men who also are losing their jobs or who have pulled back voluntarily are also doing more. Um, and, and that's an interesting piece because past research has showed that, you know, when men are unemployed, um, or they're out earned by their partners that, that you know, they sort of, um, you know, kind of uh, assert their masculinity and refuse to do these feminine tasks, right? That there's sort of a gender display notion to this. Um, and we're not finding that, right? Like men have available time. <laughs> and they yeah. are using that available time to good use, right? They are stepping up and doing more childcare um, and housework. Um, you know, and, but you're right. I mean, you know, the, the economic impact of the, uh, of, of the pandemic has hit women harder than it has hit men. Um, we're showing that when one of the partners is an essential worker, that men actually are more likely to be doing less at home. Um, huh. Yeah, so that's, that's interesting. Um, we're finding that, um, you know, the lack of childcare that women are more likely to be doing more, but that doesn't impact what men are doing. So childcare has disappeared and who's doing more of it? Women are doing more of it. And then also mm. this, this impact of, of the lack of schooling option, you know, is not being able to send kids to school. When families are, are producing e-learning content um, for, for their kids, they're responsible for finding it, you know, and setting it up. Right. You find that, um, that both parents actually are doing more childcare in that respect and men are doing more housework too. Uh, so that's an interesting kind of piece to this. But yeah, yeah. definitely, you know, the work kind of um, situation matters. And obviously the family structure matters. And we only looked at, at, at couples, but, yeah. you know, the burdens on single parents, I, I, you know, God bless them, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So at this point, let me turn to Dan Herman. So Dan, you are with the New York City Dads Group. Um, you are also the primary caregiver from what I understand. Um, so talk a little bit about your situation. Does, what rings true to you? What, what's your situation been like before the pandemic? How has the pandemic changed, you know, uh, what's happening in your family and what you do as a, as a dad and as a caregiver? Oh, thanks, Bridget. Um, yeah, so I can resonate with uh, what the three people said uh, prior uh, in almost everything that you've identified. So prior to the pandemic, or if you wanna rewind to this time last year, I was working as a tech executive for you know, a pretty decent sized global company, um, working on really big projects with large global banks. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, my wife got pregnant um, March 13th of last year. And we, she gave birth to our daughter, Aria, who is now almost seven months old. So oh, congratulations. Thank you. She was, um, and we're first time parents. And she was born on November 24th, and I actually lost my job on November 15th. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I was pretty much shown the door unceremoniously. Um, but, you know, we were excited about having a baby, and everything went great. Um, and I've certainly developed a new appreciation for women and my wife after um, having gone through that together. But um, we had a plan where we were going to uh, stay at home with our daughter for the first three months. And we met um, during that time, my wife ran into some issues, um, nothing major, but she was feeling isolated and mm. going through breastfeeding is pretty difficult. So yeah. uh, we looked for solutions together and she found a support group full of moms. And it's really been life-changing in that it's helped get her through you know, some of the early parts of being a mother, but it also um, helped us connect with people who we really uh, created good relationships with that we mm -hmm. spend time together. Um, I've met a few other dads um, 
who have a daughter uh, that are same age as mine. And uh, it's been uh, such a great help for us. Yeah. Um, so uh, not to belabor the story, but we found a couple uh, who lives close by. We live in Midtown East in New York City who uh, were in the group and we decided we were going to share a nanny together. Mm -hmm. And the first day back of work for my wife um, was the last day she went to the office. It was, oh wow! Uh, I think, yeah, it was March 9th and her office has been closed indefinitely. And she works in the travel industry. So her industry has been battered and her company sure. had to go through several stages of restructuring, which were painful. We didn't know if she was going to have a job wow. and, um, you know, it was a very stressful time combined with the fact that we didn't know if we were safe because people were losing their lives left and right in the yeah. city. So frightening. Yeah. So, and I had just come back from San Francisco and I had a job opportunity that fell through because of the pandemic. I hedged my bets and I had another opportunity and that also fell through. So I've, my role as, you know, someone who's constantly on the road, um, working with very large companies focus on big problems has changed to where I really have one responsibility and that's to support my wife and daughter. Mm. And um, I empathize with what the gentleman said earlier in that, you know, I didn't identify with uh, the person who is in charge of that responsibility. I think I particularly lacked the patience and the sensitivity to take care of a baby. Mm. I never held a baby. Uh, the, I think the closest um, in age that I've spent time with a child is a two-year-old. So I've never, I have no experience with kids. Um, wow. I have a very small family. So, you know, things have changed and. You know, <laughs> that sounds like an understatement. <laughs> if you've never held a baby and now you're like, a, you know, totally in charge. Yeah. So t tell us about how that's changed. No, I, I think that, you know, there was a lot of tension in the house that was caused by me um, due to my, you know, just frustration. And after a while, it just becomes enough. So, um, you know, I've, I guess I've, I just turned the corner about a month ago. And I think a, a lot of the progress we've made as a, a city where things seem to be a little less restrictive now, we've started socializing a little more with our friends and family at a distance, um, yeah. trying to be responsible. So I think going back to some of the patterns of behavior before pandemic has just, you know, improved just our sense of well-being. But I didn't want to be the guy who created tension in the house. Um, and I wanted to just enjoy and embrace whatever time I have with my daughter and watch her grow because I know pretty soon I'm going to be back to work and, um, you know, she's going to be spending time in daycare. So I, um, and it's funny, it only occurred to me five months after my wife joined a group for me to join. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I haven't met with these gentlemen yet, but um, I'm starting to reach out more and try to speak with people who are, you know, sympathetic or even this discussion in itself is very helpful because um, it's hard to understand or know what you're feeling if it's just me that's creating a problem or is this frustration that I should be dealing with or is it common for everyone else? So I'm glad that I jumped into this. I've never done a podcast before, so I just thought it'd be fun. But <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I just say I'm, 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 gl I'm glad you're here. Um, you know, at, at this point, what I'd love to do though, is I'd like to bring Glenn Henry back in and, and then uh, Dan Herman, I'm gonna come back to you to see if, if some of this rings true. Um, you know, when I, when I spoke with Glenn the other day, he was saying that, uh, you know, for many men, this pandemic is, is like a culture shock, uh, you know, because he's home, he's working at home. And he said, so when the 11 month old pounds on the door, you know, you pick that, you pick the child up and, uh, you know, completely changes uh, how you, how you go about your day. Uh, but he also talked a little bit about some of the, the tensions um, that, that, can, that can occur with, between um, you know, men and women and Dan, some, some of what you'd brought up. So if we could please play the clip uh, of Glenn talking about laundry. 
with moms, you know, they 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 want us to be around, but sometimes it's like we want you to I want you to do it this way. You know what I'm saying? It sounds like, no, I'm gonna do it like a dad does it because I'm a dad. You know what I mean? And just because it's not your way, that doesn't mean it's not right. You know, and so my wife and I have had plenty of conversations about that because, um, you know, sometimes like <laughs> I would wake up early and like just do laundry and then like she'd be like, thanks. But all the clothes are folded, not how they're supposed to be folded. But I'm like, yo, <laughs> I did the laundry. But, you know, like sometimes like it's kind of like she my wife wishes she had the capacity to do it herself. She wished she didn't have to ask me for help. And I've been trying to like help her understand, like, listen, like I am here to help you. That is what I'm here for. Let me help. Like it's not going to be done co correctly like like you want it done as if you were doing it. But it will still be done so that you can, uh, you know, put your energy elsewhere. You know, so so Dan Herman, uh, does that ring true to you? That that's that sense of uh, you know uh, different standards and kind of do it my way, or yeah, I, I read a book about something like this. It's I call it the narcissism of small differences. Um, I, I my wife and I have always been good at splitting up the the work, the division of labor in the house. Um, I don't mind doing things myself, but um, I think with the baby, it was definitely like that. But I think it was more so in a sense that, you know, my, mo my wife's mothering instincts were kicking in and for her, you know, nothing was good enough. She wanted to be a perfectionist. And there were some tensions around that, especially in the first two months when the baby wasn't sleeping through the night. Mm, but yeah. I think once the, um, the baby started sleeping and we started sleeping, uh, we had a lot more patience in talking through um, our parenting philosophies and it took almost six months, but now it's sort of like a tag team effort where mm -hmm. um, whatever the baby needs, one of us is going to do it. And since we're in this tiny apartment, I know exactly um, when she's going to be on an important conference call, which means it's my turn to take care of the baby. And uh, she's pretty much the ambassador um, for the baby. She takes care of the clothing, the feeding, introducing solids, maintaining milestones. And I just sort of fill in um, when she's working. So we have a good, I'd, I'd say, chemistry around that. And it took about, you know, five, six months to build. Mm. You know, at this point, I want to turn to Haley. So Haley, um, you know, one of the things that struck me when Glenn was talking about doing the laundry, he said that, you know, he wants to be a helper. He wants to help around the house. And even Dan, you know, just now you've talked about, you know, you do the, the fill in, so to speak, but that that your wife is still figuring out what good the clothes are and, you know, the sizes of things. You know, you've written a lot about mental labor, that sort of invisible load that uh, that can really uh, sometimes it's not measurable, but can make uh, the person doing that invisible labor feel even more burdened, like it's even more work. What can you talk about? Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the invisible mental load? Sure. I mean, the, one of the best ways to explain this to people, I think, is to think about the paid workforce, where um, the job of strategy, of vision, and then finding out a way to execute that vision, make sure it was followed up with, not only is that a full job, but it usually comes with a raise or a promotion. You know, that's, that's management. And that has to happen in the house, too. And so it's really important that when we think about the work that it takes to make a household run and function and hopefully be ha a happy and healthy place, that um, that somebody is is making sure it gets done that that pickups are scheduled um, as they need to be that meals are planned that you've got the groceries on hand to make the nutritious meals that you want and we know that it's overwhelmingly women who do this and that sometimes the mental load is kind of the last piece of the puzzle uh, before it's solved that it's one thing to redistribute the kind of tangible concrete tasks in a household and another to redistribute well who's going to think about this work mm, and one yeah. of the reasons for that is it's invisible um, and very often if you're not the one doing that work thinking through those problems and doing that problem solving you're not aware it's happening because it's happening so well you know things are happening in such a, a seamless way so one of the pieces of advice that that we've been giving couples and um and that marriage therapists give couples is to make that work tangible by writing it down you know mm. make it make it a thing um who plans pick up 
up and drop off? Who plans getting the kids homeschooling done with them? Who plans the play date? Um, actually list these things as tasks. These are planning development tasks, but they're really important. And it's important that you don't overlook those and you make sure that when a couple wants to divide up that work, that's on the total list of things that you're going to split up. Mm, that's great advice. Yeah, that was something that uh, early on I wish I had known <laughs> when, I, when my kids were little. Um, you know, we're, we're coming down on time. So um, Dan Carlson, I want to give you the, the last word about like what, what could last and where do we go from here if we want to really lean into uh, creating opportunities for couples to have gender equality or gender equity, if that's what they choose. You know, you want to be able to form your family in whatever way it is that you want to form it. But let me go back to Dan Herman for just a, really briefly. You know, Dan, I'm, I'm really curious. You talked about, uh, you know, you're spending all this time with your daughter now uh, because of the pandemic and you're all sort of on top of each other in your apartment. But you do talk about at some point you're going to go back to work and your daughter's going to go off to childcare. And I wonder if, if you think because of the experience through the pandemic or, you know, being unemployed, do you think you'll, that will change the way that you're engaged or will that change the way that you, you do or think about yourself as a father, even when you do go back to work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I spent that much time thinking about that. I, I know I, I definitely will experience some separation anxiety because my daughter is deeply integrated to all of my routines now. And um, I, I have such a strong bond with her now that it, it hurts just to think about sending her off to childhood. And then I think the other point you're referring to is like maybe just the guilt factor of focusing on myself now that I'm not taking care of her all the time. Um, I think it's just something I have to do because we live in Manhattan and it's expensive to live here. And we're living in austerity now um, where you know, our income is about 50% of what it was last year and costs are only going up. So it's important for me to get back in the workforce. I'm sure I'll appreciate my time with her much more now. I'm very grateful for this experience. I wouldn't change it for anything, not for a million dollars. Mm, okay, well, great. And we'll see what happens in the future. You know, so Dan, Dan Carlson, let me, let me turn to you talking about the future. Um, you know, you're saying, again, through some of the research you're showing that while it's not utopia, it's not nirvana, we're not, we're not at parity, there is movement toward more gender equality. I guess what I wonder is, you know, once things open up, we, we have a vaccine, will things snap back? Or, or could this be lasting? What are, and, and if it's going to be lasting, what will it take? Um, it's a good question, right? And obviously the, the future is yet to be written um, but what we know about men who take leave and who stay at home, um, that research shows that even if they go, after they go back to work, they still remain engaged and do more housework and childcare than, than before leave. And so that suggests that even if we kind of snap back into, you know, similar work patterns as before, that, m that, 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 that the amount of, of housework and childcare that men are doing now, that that increase, that that, that level will be maintained and that levels of equality will, will stay heightened um, and it'll be a new normal. But mm -hmm. at the same time, getting back to the structural issues, we don't know what's gonna happen with childcare. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't know what's gonna happen with schools. Right. Um, but we do know people are gonna go back to work. And that's really where the rubber hits the road, right? Is, is okay, so we're all going back to, to our jobs. Uh, many of us will leave telecommuting and, and go back to, to offices. But will childcare and schools also open and will we have those same supports that, that we used to have? I mean, there's also still the possibility that we'll have more supports than before the pandemic. I mean, some jobs will never go back to the office. I have yeah. uh, a neighbor who works at Young Living here in Salt Lake City, right? And they do essential oils and things like this. And he told me the other day that, um, that, that he's never going back to the office. They have gave them money and to create remote offices and they have no intentions of letting those, those workers come back. Wow. Will that happen for a lot of other companies? Who knows? But it's a possibility, right, that, that you know, we'll have more flexibility, right, in our jobs than we used to. Mm. And that bodes well. Um, so, you know, some signs are positive and, and some, you know, um, might be negative. So, again, we'll just have to see. All right. We'll have to see. Haley, I'm going to give you the, the last word and then we'll, then we'll wrap up. 
I just want to echo what what Professor Carlson was was saying there. I think that is is really significant. Um, the the truth is from this study, I found you know these calls for men to do more, to care more, the idea that we want involved dads in the United States people's hearts and minds are there for the for the, the vast majority of, of American parents. They say, we want equal parenting. We want shared responsibility. But they're doing this under duress, you know, trying to find these solutions, like, like Dan Herman is talking about on 50% of their regular income. Right. Th this is a struggle. This is a country that doesn't even guarantee paid maternity leave, let alone paternity leave to fathers. This is a country where childcare is falling apart right before our eyes, and it was already a pretty tattered and broken system. Only only about half of child care centers have reopened yeah. and and child care has been given 3.5 billion dollars of support where you know Delta Airlines alone has been given five billion dollars so yeah. if as a country we really want to allow parents to be able to be conscientious and deliberate about sharing the load we need to provide them the policy and economic support that they, they need to be able to do that absolutely well I want to thank all of the panelists for being here today for sharing your stories and your perspectives I want to thank the participants. Uh, we had some lively chat. Uh, thank you so much for sharing those resources and stories as well. And I, I want to thank the New America Events team, the Better Life Lab. I want to uh, give a shout out to Jed Zaya St. Julian, who works for our program. She's the one who connected us with Glenn Henry and Belief in Fatherhood, which is a fantastic YouTube channel. If you haven't seen it, do check it out. Uh, the videos are really fun and great. I also want to thank uh, David Schulman, our producer, uh, thank all of you for being here. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at uh, telemedicine equity and the future of medicine and how that will impact work and care systems. And uh, I hope all of you stay safe, wash your hands, uh, and we'll see you next week.